and that we are here on this earth as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Now that description, when we, we think about that, we understand that uh, this world is not our home any longer. We have a home waiting for us. But we're here on a mission. But I don't know about you, it is, um, you know, I, I was born in the United States of America, and I think that, uh, that I probably bleed red, white, and blue, like many of you here. I know we have some of you from other places that have come to make this country your home. And, and it is, um, I don't think it's bad at all that wherever we're from, we have a, um, an association, uh, a connection, a loyalty. Uh, we, we feel good when we think about that place that's home. It might be a local, you know, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and somebody walks in and they have a southern accent. And, and uh, I, I, I just think that's probably what it's going to sound like in heaven, you know. I mean, we, we have this connection to this place. And the spiritual reality is, well, things are changed now because of Christ. Now, uh, this does not mean that we throw out all our connections, but we have to understand that there is one connect, there's a, a relationship we have now that trumps everything. It trumps absolutely everything. And that's your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God help us to keep that priority in our lives and keep it straight. But as ambassadors for Christ, you know, we represent him in this world, but we still are flesh and blood and we are still in a place where we call our temporary home. And, and, and there is a love and a loyalty there that we need to put into perspective with God. And, uh, and so I love this country and, uh, but I have a responsibility to it. And God's given me a responsibility to it. So let's try to understand how God deals in the affairs of men. Now we've, we've done this before. Some of you say, I'm starting to remember some of this. Well, I, I hope you do. We, you know, I, I hope that this, this helps you because it's very needful for me all the time. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18 is a, is a very interesting passage. There's an illustration here that's used several times in Scripture. Uh, the, the illustrations of a potter and the clay. Now we talk to the children here about ownership. Who owns everything? The world and all that's in it? Well, that's God. And this principle that we're talking about here is associated with that, the ownership of God. And so the first thing we need to understand is that He is God. It belongs to Him. Now I know that it all doesn't act like it belongs to God. You notice that? Have you ever noticed that sometimes you act like you don't belong to God? That doesn't change the fact that you do. But sometimes this world is just not in harmony with, with the Lord. In fact, much of it is not. And that's why, that's why we, need, uh, we need Adam and men like him that are willing to, to stand up against tyranny and evil in this world. Because there are people who don't follow God. But anyway, in Jeremiah chapter 18, let's read this scripture. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the, <coughs> excuse me. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can not I do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And God here is, is demonstrating his sovereignty and his ownership that this nation, these people, they belong to him. <coughs> And they exist for his purpose. Okay? And so he says, uh, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down, to destroy it, 
If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Now, some of you are just thinking, I read that somewhere. <laughs> Remember in the prophet Jonah? Jonah, go to Nineveh, this, this great city of the Assyrians, the enemies of Israel, and preach to them. And, uh, of course, Jonah dropped everything and ran right away. No, he didn't. But uh, eventually he got there, and uh, not with a cheerful attitude did he obey God, but he did obey God, and he preached that judgment was coming upon the city of Nineveh, and they were going to be destroyed in 40 days. Well, what happened? Lo and behold, something very strange happened in history. Everybody in Nineveh, from the king down to the most humble person, said, Oh my goodness, God's going to destroy us. Let's humble ourselves. Let's seek Him. Let's tell Him how sorry we are. We, we, we want Him to show mercy to us. We ask for forgiveness. And so they humble and they seek God. Lord, have mercy on us. And you know what? That's just the way God is. God is a merciful God. And so He showed mercy to the people of Nineveh. Now, Jonah was very unhappy about that. <laughs> but... But see, that's the way God is. He takes no pleasure, Scripture says, in the death of the wicked. And so, when that, that nation turns from the evil, I, I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build and to plan it, if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. So it's not that God changes, God's character is the same, but the people that, or the nations, you know, have a responsibility to God. And so how God treats people on the earth and nations on the earth has something to do with the behavior of these people, okay? And, and we, can't, we can't deny that, you know? I mean, it's, just, it's not just God doing whatever He wants. There's reason behind why God does what He does. But we need to understand God has the right and the authority to do. And whatever the Lord does, it is right and it is good, okay? And so there's a principle that He, he says about how He works with nations, okay? Now, God's timing is different than ours, right? If, um, hey Anna, how about just turning it off? There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> let's move on. Exodus chapter 19. Uh, here, here Moses has is, is, um, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. God has judged Egypt and he has delivered Israel. Okay. Now, he didn't say that that was because the, um, <coughs> that Israel was so special. No, they, there was nothing really special. It was God chose to show his delight in them. And so in verse 3 of Exodus 19, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Anna, 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 I know you don't understand, but we can hear you all over the room, okay? I didn't shut it right, I didn't have to shut it. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> all right. So Moses went to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Yep, they saw that. And, uh, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So God offers to Israel here a special place in his plan and purpose. Now, this is conditional, isn't it? Uh, not that he chose Israel, but for them to be in that place, for them to be that holy nation, that pre holy priesthood, for them to do that, they need to obey the covenant that God has given to them. And if they, and, and by the way, if you read the next 
verse, they said, whatever the Lord says, we'll do it, you know. Um, they, they didn't quite follow through, but, uh, you know, uh, good intentions, I guess. Uh, it, they, did, they, they didn't really know everything God was going to require for them, you know. But uh, there's a conditional covenant as far as the blessings that God received. Their existence in the land and enjoying the blessings was conditional on them fulfilling their part of the covenant. Okay, And that's an example of how God is dealing with the potter and the clay and, and with Israel and with um, the Assyrians. Here we have examples of how God deals with peoples and nations. Okay, Now a guy named Benjamin Franklin, he, he flew a kite and he came up with the idea of insurance and a lot of other crazy things. <laughs> but, um, but he did say something very wonderful here. He's one of our nation's founding fathers, isn't he? He said, I lived, a, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, he did live a long time, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground unseen by him, it, is it possible that an empire could arise without his aid? And so here they're trying to hammer out a constitution for this great country at, in its infancy, and this is a statement that... Um, this man makes. Some people think that uh, he was an atheist, but uh, clearly not, not. But anyway, that's some wisdom there, isn't it? That is actually what we see, okay? And we need to understand that. God is not on a trip. God hasn't just said, okay, get it started and uh, I'll come back later on and see how you're doing. The scripture teaches and the witness of life is that God is involved in life on earth, okay? He is involved in the affairs of men. Now, uh, granted, God works differently than I would, <laughs> okay? And uh, my goodness, He works so. He is long-suffering merciful, you know? I mean, uh, I think I mentioned before, I... If we're back in Egypt, I would have volunteered to be the angel of death. That's just how I am sometimes. That, that's, I'm glad I wasn't there and God knew better than to put me in charge of anything. But the fact is, God is merciful and He works differently. And we say, God, you know, you need to get them. And God says, I'll get them when it's time. You just mind your own business and let me be God. All right. I hate when He does that. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Daniel chapter 4, we, we see some examples of this. Um, Daniel is a great book to demonstrate God working in the affairs of men. Okay, so uh, I imagine, Jim, you're going to use some of Daniel in your study of, of last days, aren't you? Yeah, I don't see how you could do it without it. Daniel chapter 4, verse 24 says, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, they shall drive you from men, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like an oxen. They shall wet you with dew of heaven, seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and He gives it to whomever He chooses. Now this is the, in Daniel's um, first interpretive dream there, or vision, there is the head of gold, and that was Babylon, and that was Nebuchadnezzar, this man. I mean, he was the, the, the purest example of a total dictator that's ever existed, I imagine. I mean, he was a ruler, and he understood power and how to wield it. But, but there's something he doesn't understand, that, that he is under somebody's authority. And God says, I'm going to teach you that you are here to serve me. And so God took away his mind. And for seven years, he was a crazy man. And then God restored his kingdom to him. Now, so, you know, here we take the, the top dog as far as men on the earth, and he gets cut down a few rungs. Because this is the truth. God is the one who rules in the affairs of men. Psalm 75, it tells us in verse 6 that exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west, 
uh, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. It is the, and, it, and the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely as dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns, which symbolizes power, uh, of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. And so God is saying, I am involved in what's going on around here. Okay. Uh, we have an example here. And let's, let's go quickly through this passage here because it's a little extensive. But notice God dealing with the, this nation. He says, <coughs> by the way, this is the nation that received mercy when Jonah came and preached to them. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation. Against the people of my wrath I will give him charge. To seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. <coughs> Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idol whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria. As I have done to Samaria and to her idols, shall I not do to Jerusalem and to her idols? Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all His work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his haughty looks. For He says, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, I have robbed their treasuries, so I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand is found like a nest in the riches of the people, as, um, and as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there and was no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth, even with a peep. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? If a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood, therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and it will, be cons it will consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. Now, Assyria was the dominant power, as he speaks. God has used this wicked, godless nation to chasten his own people, the northern tribes of Israel. He has used them to chasten other peoples who were um, just evil in the sight of God. That doesn't mean that Assyria was righteous. They were not. But they were used of God as a weapon or chastisement against those but what he says is Assyria has given himself credit and he said, this is my power and I'm the one who nobody can stand before me because I'm so mighty. And God is saying, you don't know, but you're going to come to an end just like that because you are just like a tool in my hand. And so the pride of Assyria's heart was uh, what brought them low to the ground. And this great city of Nineveh, you know, wonder in the ancient world was destroyed and conquered just like that. And this is, this is uh, th th these scriptures here are testifying to God and, and peoples and nations and what it is that God does and, and, and um, 
and the right that he has to do it. Uh, after the fall of uh, Assyria, Babylon rose to power. Nebuchadnezzar was a great king. Uh, he had a grandson that uh, really didn't have the full throne, uh, but his father was, you know, uh, you know, sharing the throne and out on busy stuff like vacations and whatever, uh, <laughs> playing golf or whatever they did back then. But anyway, uh, this, is, this little story in Daniel chapter 5, um, the king of Babylon is having a party while his great capital is surrounded by enemies. He is so prideful that he thinks there is no way anybody can invade this city. You know, we're the greatest. And, um, and while he's, they're having this drunken party, he decides to show his greatness and have the, the uh, vessels that were used in the worship in Jerusalem that were conquered by his grandfather uh, brought into this party and used for their celebration. So the holy is defiled. And at that point, God says, this is enough. And, and there is a hand that, that appears, just a hand. <laughs> I imagine it's a big hand. But anyway, this big hand shows up and it begins to write on the wall where everybody can see it. The king can see it. And... Uh, you know, it just took the life out of the party for some reason. <laughs> and, uh, and so they don't know what it says. Many, many tickle you far some. I, what is, I don't know what that means. But uh, they didn't know. And so uh, the queen mother says, hey, you know, we've been here before. Daniel knows. He talked to his God. God will give the interpretation. So they call Daniel. And Daniel says, this is the interpretation of each word. Meaning God has numbered your kingdom and it's over. <laughs> Tikal, you have been weighed in the balances and uh, there's not much there. Uh, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. They're right outside the wall right now and they're coming in tonight. That's what, that's what took place there. So uh, God didn't always do this in such a way, but here's another demonstration you know, you can be prideful. You can think you're in charge, but you need to understand God works in the affairs of men because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Psalm 9, <clears throat> this, this, uh, we're almost done. I know you're just getting warmed up. All right, uh, Psalm 9, it says, uh, verse 17, The wicked shall be turned into hell. That, that, that's Sheol. Uh, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail, for the nations be judged. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Think about that. And... Uh, you know what's kind of interesting? Um, this, I, I noticed that, that uh, you know, being American, we're always right, okay? <laughs> but I have noticed that there are other peoples on the face of the earth that sometimes they think they're right too. And so it's not really if we think we're right or not. It's if we are in agreement with God. During the war of uh, northern aggression on the agricultural south, the, uh, no, I'm just kidding. The, uh, you can tell where I'm from, right? All right, but uh, President Lincoln said something very wise. Somebody asked him, you know, uh, you know, is God on our side? And he says, you know, I don't worry too much about God being on our side. I'm worried about us being on his side. And, and that this is what, you know, it's not enough that we think we're on God's side or we think we're right. We need to go to the Word of God and find out, Lord, what is your heart on this? What is your will on this? And, and we look and we evaluate our, our nation and our policies and all these things. Is this honoring to God? Is, is our country a vessel unto honor because we... We honor the Lord and accept His sovereignty and we, we seek to be righteous before Him. 
It's, it's righteousness that exalts a people. And, and it's, it's not the size of our military or the wonder of our great heritage. You know, that, 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 that works for a little while, it seems to, because God is long-suffering, patient. But we see, just like uh, the king of Babylon, he said, you've been weighed and there's nothing there. I mean, uh, your, your kingdom is over. There's it's, it's a thing where God says, enough is enough. I'm through with you. And you say, well, could that ever happen to us? Well, the pattern is from Scripture, it can happen to any nation that's on the face of the earth. You say, but, but, but America has a Christian foundation and we've been a Christian nation. But the first thing we read about the potter is that, you know, if he, he has the right. And, and in, in a nation that does right, but turns from that right, then God, the sovereign of the universe, can say, enough with you. And, and this is why we need to, need to pray for um, our, our leadership. All right, uh, we're going to skip this portion, Romans 13, but it, it, it's God's description. He uses the Apostle Paul to tell us how government is supposed to operate and why we're supposed to be subject to it. But, but people, we are responsible to behave with what we know in the position God has given us. And, and, and people in government are held accountable by God, too. Okay, so um, that's why we need to pray for them. <coughs> Timothy, and we'll close with this passage here. You know, what, what is my responsibility? Well, 1 Timothy 2 <coughs> says, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, and that's, uh, that's obedience to God because you don't want to pray for all men, do you? you know, you're, sometimes we're like Jonah. Lord, I don't want to warn them. I just want you to get them. <laughs> right? But, but here the Holy Spirit says, pray for them. Okay? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Um, for kings... We don't have any kings, but, but we do have people who are in authority. We need to pray for them, all who are in authority, that, here's, here, here's you know, just don't pray for them. Lord, I, God bless President Obama, God bless whoever, whoever, whoever. No, you, you pray for them specifically, and this is one thing that, that <laughs> I hate to say this, but that that they would leave us alone, okay? <laughs> That's basically what it is. You, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be under the Lordship of Christ. You're, you're supposed to be disciplined by the Word of God, and you're supposed to lead a responsible life, and you're not supposed to be a burden, you're supposed to be a blessing, and you're supposed to be an example. And you're not supposed to need a bunch of external controls on you because you're controlled internally by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And so God says, that being the case, you follow me, you let my Word uh, be fruitful in your life, and then you pray that the externals, because there are people all around us that need externals. There are people on your street. There are people... In your workplace, there are people in schools, there are people everywhere around us that are not governed by the Holy Spirit. And they need, the less we follow God, the more we need external controls. And we see the growth of government in our society is because we don't let God tell us what to do. Well, somebody's going to tell you what to do. You know, what is the worst form of government there is? It's anarchy. It's anarchy. And uh, we don't want anarchy. But when everybody's trying to do what's right in their own eyes, when well, somebody says, we can't live that way, and so somebody's going to start saying, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do this. But the child of God, we shouldn't need that. Because God's telling us, let's get busy about His stuff. Okay? <laughs> All right.
so that we pray for them so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's what God wants. I'm so glad that I can want what God wants. Because what God wants, He's wise, He's good. And Lord, I don't understand all the things that you want, but I know what you want is best. And that begins right here with me. You know, Lord, let me have what I want, but I want what you want for everybody else. No, no, no. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his desire. That's the heart of God. That's why we need to take the heart of God for ourselves. God doesn't hate these people. He might hate what they're doing, but he loves them. Jesus died for everyone on the face of this earth. You'll never walk up to anyone and say, I wonder if you, Jesus died for you or not. You don't have to do that. Christ died for the sins of the world. John says he was the satisfying payment not only for our sins as Jews, but for the sins of the whole world. Isn't that amazing? You will never meet a person that Christ did not die for their sins. But they need to believe that, don't they? They need to receive his payment for their sins. God's desire is that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. There is one God. That's not knowledge that everybody has, folks. And even if some people believe in one God, they don't all know the true and living God. And that's why God left us here. We know him. We need to make him known. There's one mediator between God and man. There's not this whole religious system that people have to jump through all these hoops and go to this person, that person, please intercede for me, please intercede for me. There's Jesus. One mediator, the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. That gives us hope, doesn't it? So, oh, you know, our society is embracing things that God hates. I mean, we're destroying generations here. Our children are being corrupted and destroyed. You know, they're going to grow up and they're going to be in charge someday. You're scary, isn't it? I mean, we already have people in Washington who were teenagers in the 60s. You see, that explains a lot, doesn't it? Okay, yeah, okay. All right, we understand. This is, this is why we need to pray. And this is why we need to walk uprightly. You know, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. But... While I'm passing through, the Lord's given me a big responsibility. He's given it to you too. This world is, it, God desires all men to be saved. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says, my love, my grace for them is to shine through you. <laughs>